Jan Yi Kellick is the senior editor of the Epoch Times. <laughs> you know, the Epoch Times is a staple of the world. You know, it's so, it, it's so often when I travel the globe, people say, do you read the Epoch Times? Or someone will send me articles from Epoch Times. So I had an opportunity to sit and get to know Jan, I said, man, we've got to sit down because people really need to understand the Epoch Times. Welcome to uh, our national broadcast, and thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks so much, Armstrong. Fantastic to be here. So, so let me get this straight. Um, you have 35 publications around the world. You're not allowed in mainstream China. Uh, you have the NTD, which, the, which is the Nitang Dynasty. Um, uh, they consider you to be a right-wing organization. You oppose communist China. You also believe that the Chinese have been manipulated and spreading propaganda in the United States for a long time. And their ultimate goal uh, is to use this propaganda warfare to overtake America. And you fight against that. Uh, uh, how long has the Epoch Times been around? Well, since 2000, it was actually founded by Chinese Americans. It's kind of an amazing uh, story of the kind of the American dream happening, actually. I, I, uh, so my parents came from communist Poland. They're also kind of a story of, let's say, the North American dream. But Epoch, uh, well, our founder actually came from, uh, he was in the student movement in 89. You know, people have heard about the Tiananmen Square massacre. He wasn't actually there, but this was a movement across the entire country. And a lot of them that kind of made it and weren't too much on the government's radar and the could got scholarships. He ended up going to Georgia Tech, uh, kind of a brilliant theoretical physicist. And he ended up, you know, and in 99, when the Chinese regime kind of found its new target, it wasn't the democracy uh, dissidents or activists. It was the uh, spiritual group Falun Gong practitioners of that. Um, in order to justify it, they basically created, you know, what they always do, which is oodles and oodles of hate propaganda, basically attempting to demonize these people. We see these kind of tactics all over the place often. Um, and John, being in America, in Atlanta, he thought, hey, I can actually do something now. I'm in America. There's a First Amendment here, and we can tell the truth about what's happening what, in communist China. What is it China. that we, as Americans, don't understand about how the Chinese operate? <laughs> a great many things. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the most important things, it's very, very difficult for people that grow up in a free society or a mostly free society to actually understand what it's like to live under a totalitarian regime. I'll give you an example, okay? In my family, we had a rule. I grew up, I, I was, I kind of, upon, I came out upon arrival, I grew up in Canada, okay? And um, in my family, the rule was, you can say nothing that we talk about in the family, outside the family. And my parents were tough to deal with, you know? So I, I had all this, you know, stuff I wanted to discuss with my friends, but I knew it would be treason to, to say anything. And I only realized 20 years, maybe 30 years later, really why this was the rule. Because in a totalitarian society, everybody is incentivized to spy and report on everybody else. And you assume that to be the default, unless there's people that you have deep, that you've developed deep trust with. And even then, you know, when, going back to Poland, when they revealed the, all the dossiers that were held after 89, after democracy came to Poland and people got to see, you know, who it was that was actually spying on them. It was wives spying on husbands. It was priests reporting confessions. It was everything, right? And that's a mind job. Imagine, you know, if I, in our society, if I think everybody's a potential spy on me, how, how would we behave differently? That's just one thing, but I think it's a very important one. Explain to us the 
structure of Epoch Times. <laughs> Take us inside the organization. Okay. Um, well, let's start. Let me do a couple of data points. First of all, our uh, <laughs> truth and tradition is our tagline. Um, uh, I think in, in Wikipedia, one of the few things that's actually true about us, it says political orientation, anti-communist. <laughs> we don't expressly say that, but I think it would be fair, right? We see that as a bad system. Um, how, in terms of structure, um, we developed quite, every office has a lot of independence in how it functions, okay? Around the central editorial vision where truth and tradition would be kind of the simplest approximation of that. Um, but based in New York, we're, and, we're based in New York City. And you yeah. have offices in um, Washington, D.C. Correct. You have them in Texas. Correct. You have them throughout California. Yep, uh, Northern uh, uh, Los know, Irvine, Angeles. L.A., and uh, so Orange County, L.A., and also uh, uh, the Bay Area. And you also have the New Tang Dynasty, NTD, the television division. So, so NTD is our sister mm -hmm. TV network, and we've kind of, uh, they, uh, let me just mention that NTD started with a similar mission. Epoch Times started in Chinese language to tell the truth to Chinese people in America be, who were being propagandized by Chinese media in America. Okay, and then it changed when they realized, my goodness, all these American media are just taking these Chinese Commun Communist Party talking points and regurgitating them, right? So we, we, we have to do something in English. I mean, this, these were the very early years, and then it kind of grew into something much bigger than that. We want to talk about but, what that grew into when we come back on this edition of the Armstrong Williams Show. The senior editor of the Epoch Times is our guest. We'll be back. Jan Yee Kellick is our guest. He's the Epoch Times senior editor. What have you expanded into? And what is your main goal? And why is it that so many people are fascinated? And why is it that the mainstream media does everything it can to discredit you as a conspiratorial, um, right-leaning media empire? We live in really crazy times, Armstrong. I, if I, I could not have predicted that just doing something really simple, which is what we do, which is focus on truth telling. You know how they say, you know, oh, that didn't age well or that aged well, talking about news stories and so forth. Our content <laughs> that we do both in video and, and written ages incredibly well. And the secret is actually the simplest thing ever. It's just simply try to seek the truth. That's our highest that's our highest goal, and and report it fairly and honestly to people, so they can kind of figure out what's going on in the world, so make up their own minds you about know, it. What is fascinating has been your coverage on the Israel-Hamas war, okay, and how you've even challenged platforms like TikTok. And while people may say it's pro-Israeli, pro-Jew, you say no. I we just we have reporters with people on the ground. We report the truth and the facts. Talk about that coverage and how you've come to your own conclusions about what the real situation is in the Middle East. Hmm. This, is, this is a really difficult problem uh, to, well, let me put it this way. No one wants war. No one wants people dying. Palestinian, Israeli, doesn't matter. We don't, you, we don't want that. But it's like, I, I find there's almost every issue we try to cover, right? There's, there's this kind of moral imprimatur that's thrown into it. And when you cover it, as we do, I think, honestly, people will assume, well, you're on one side or another, right? How do we cover it? We, we do our best to try to report what's happening there with the best of our sources. We actually have an Israeli edition. It's, it's different than uh, it's actually a monthly magazine over there uh, because every area kind of developed on its own. So we have a lot of very good uh, on the ground information coming in. Um, and I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. We report on it. I, I for, for American thought leaders for my show, I did an interview, for example, with Sarah Idan, right? Sarah Idan was Miss Iraq uh, Universe, um, Miss Universe Iraq. And she, some years ago, took a selfie with Miss Israel. 
And as a result of that, her family actually had to flee Iraq. And it's just, anyway, it's, fa it's a fascinating reality. Why would that be, right? We, we're trying to kind of create context for people to understand. That's the, that's the reason I mentioned this, right? And Sarah, of course, has a lot of thoughts about this particular conflict well, and what's what, going what on. Why do you think right? there's such solidarity with wealthy, affluent, a lot of young people with Hamas and, Pal and the Palestinians? I think fundamentally, I think people, well, with sort of with older people, I think a lot of people are very ill-informed. And number two, I think when it comes to younger people, there are incredibly powerful tools of influence at play. I mean, you know, when you look at, for example, the Twitter files revelations or the Missouri versus Biden lawsuit, a lot of people will not be familiar with these. But basically, these are disclosures of showing us how um, powerful en entities, including the government, nonprofits, work with social media to censor certain types of content and push other kinds of content. Okay, so we, that's that's in America now. We have, for example, TikTok. You mentioned that earlier, right? TikTok is, and I actually do talk about this kind of at length. It's, there's, I could I could talk about it for an hour how TikTok is related to the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese regime. But basically, the people at TikTok are bound by Chinese law to follow the regime's guidance, okay? So uh, there's the espionage side that's possible, and there's also the manipula manipulation side that's possible. And you can see, in terms of, let's call it pro-Hamas content on TikTok, is orders of magnitude oh. greater than what you would call you know, pro-Israel content. Okay, now wh why is that? Right, and and it's and these tools right can shape and there's I've I've done multiple multiple shows with people who have have dem are demonstrating like Dr. Robert Epstein how easy easy it is to influence people's decisions using these social media and even technologies like Google. What what if your uh, people because you also have uh, in tentacles in China. What did we miss on the Wuhan lab in COVID-19? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a sad story, okay? Because in April of 2020, we did a documentary, and this is, you know, just a few months after that we, we knew the pandemic had began, which, I mean, the, the, the documentary is very simple. It's like, looks like a duck, walks like a duck, it's probably a duck. There's a lab that's doing exactly the kind of experimentation which would lead to exactly the kind of virus that came out, which has never occurred in nature before. It makes much more sense that it's from a lab than it just randomly happened. You know, six striking, six bolts of lightning to the head would be the, the, the natural version of that, okay? It's very unlikely, that's my point. So a lot of the problem was the Chinese Communist Party line was this is natural and Unfortunately, you know, Dr. Fauci and the U.S. Uh, institution, many U.S. institutions decided that they're going to follow that for their own particular intentions. Uh, Senator Rand Paul has an incredibly thick book right now out explaining, it's called Deception, explaining why that was, okay? But if people actually were truth-seeking and were reporting truth-seeking of information, it was absolutely not rocket science to understand that the lab leak was the vastly more likely scenario. And we'll never know for sure because the smoking gun evidence has been destroyed, of course, right, in communist China. So, but, you know, I, logic, basic logic and inference dictates it's a lab leak, of course, of course it was. Jan Kelly is our guest. He's the Epic Times Senior Editor, I'm Rob Sean Williams, and we'll be back. We're back with Yanni Kelly, uh, Epic Times Senior Editor. Let's talk about gender-driven journalism in America and the world today a shocking development in a way because you know in order to have a free society this is what i've realized it's absolutely critical to have a free and fair press and for whatever reason and i've explored this extensively and i could we could talk about that if you want but 
a great many media, including some of the largest media in our country, have decided to follow a different school of journalism, which some people would call it agenda-driven and some people just call it activist. I actually think the official term for it is activist journalism. And over the past, certainly decade, there's been a huge shift in what's acceptable in journalism. In many cases, these especially younger journalists, and they're taught this, by the way, in places like Columbia Journalism School, where I've looked at the curriculum, right? That there's a certain view of the world that people are supposed to believe, and all our journalism is going to cater to that. If there's something that doesn't cater to that, is that there's a reality that's reportable that doesn't cater to that view, we, yeah, if we have to report on it, we put it on page 30 or something like that, right? Or we, or we don't talk about it at all. But we push the stuff that is the correct view. And what is the price for this when the smoke clears? I, I mean, I hope it's not a free society, the, co the, the, the loss of a free society. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it's that grave if we don't fix this. You know, you know, Epoch Times is so massive. How are you able to gain such massive distribution, such a massive subscription base so quickly? You know, I, I, I'm going to keep going back to this. Um, it, it's been tough because as we kept growing... Well, you gave it away in the beginning. We, we gave it away at the beginning, mm. but we realized that, you know, we were trying, we're, we're experimental. We were trying all sorts of different business models, right? How's this going to work? But it turned out that people are willing to pay for news that they understand is truth-seeking. That, that is, I mean, I, I, keep, I keep beating this drum, but I actually think that's the main reason, right? 1.5 million Americans bit more now I think are deeply committed to knowing what's going on in the world and having a fair view and that's why we've been growing I mean that I, I don't have a better I don't have a better explanation there's all sorts you know there you remember something called Russia gate right right now most people understand that Donald Trump was not a Russian agent I mean the whole concept was preposterous on its face at the beginning but there's some portion of the population that even to this day, because they were propagandized by media who wanted to believe this or were doing it disingenuously, that he's some sort of Russian asset. It's crazy, right? Of course, we reported honestly on this, on the information that was available from the beginning. That's what I mean by aged well. But people remember that. And now we have a lot of people that come to us because they, they saw, oh, you guys reported on this honestly back then, and then take your issue. But like, how does the Epoch time instill that discipline that integrity, that fairness, with thousands throughout thousands of employees around the world. It's very difficult. Um, very good uh, 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 hiring practices that involve a, a lot of kind of insight into what people really believe and how they want to be. But there's but there is another. There's kind of a silver lining in a way because there's a lot of truth seeking people out there and mm -hmm. including journalists and they were looking for a home. They realized, "Oh, I can't work for I, I'm not going to name specific names, but I can't work for this media anymore." And we we end up getting them. Like for example, our our uh, assistant DC bureau chief here in DC is from CNN. He worked there for 20 years, did amazing work. But now he's with us. So, so, what is your ambition for the future with with uh, with Epoch Times? Because obviously, uh, when you talk about those numbers, one point five million subscription, that can match the New York Times or any other major daily in the world. They just many of them just don't have those kind of numbers. They can't sustain it. Yeah, I think I, I mean by our estimates in terms of uh, paid subscribers, we're the number four newspaper in America right now. And some people say, well, it's not audited. Well, I'm not. I don't. I don't trust the auditors, frankly. You, you know. <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you think from your coverage uh, of the election uh, and how the election is being covered, the Biden White House? Your coverage in the Epoch Times is very unique. You always bring in a perspective or uh, a source that you say, you know, I've not read that before. I've not heard that. We, 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 a lot of the, the, this type of environment where this act, what happens is, right, as we've shifted to activist journalism, there's a reaction to that, and there's, it's almost like you feel like you have to be an activist in the other direction. And I know I, I have that feeling too sometimes when you're being kind of, uh, when all this material is being thrown at you that you know it just kind of doesn't make a ton of sense. 
you have to have a ton of discipline to try to provide an honest picture. And this is this is tough with Israel, Hamas, with all these with Ukraine, Russia, Ukraine war. There's such there's such um, in, let me put it this way, information war, right, which is you actually alluded to this early, which is a central part of how the Chinese Communist Party is attacking America. It's just one 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 prong, but a huge one has become a kind of a dominant feature. Another word for it is propaganda. It is propaganda. And I'm Armstrong Williams, and we will return with some final thoughts. If you believe every child is deserving of a quality education, please go to educationjusticefoundation.com. In all that you exposed in Epoch Times, you got to give people hope. You got to help them believe that everything that is is not lost, there's still good, and things worthwhile fighting for in the world. No, no, I I, I agree, totally agree with that, and that's actually one reason a lot of people come to us. We hear we we hear this from a lot of people that that you're you somehow approach a lot of these really difficult subjects in a kind of a positive way often, you know, when it's possible. You know, how can someone who are hearing about the Epoch Times for the first time mm -hmm. subscribe oh. and find out more about it? TheEpochTimes.com. Go to our website. You can also go to ReadEpoch.com. You can, if you're ready to subscribe, ReadEpoch.com. You can do that immediately. Jan yeah. Yekili, thank you so much for joining us. as Epoch Times Senior Editor. It's been a very wonderful, insightful conversation, one that I actually look forward to. And thank you for joining us for this edition of the Armstrong Williams Show. Dr. Tang Trang Lai is a renowned expert in artificial pancreas and diabetes technologies. Most recently, she served as clinical assistant professor in the Division of Pediatric Endocrinology. Uh, you, know, you know, Dr. Lai, it is fascinating. It is National Diabetes Month. So many people struggle and anguish over their challenges with diabetes and it seems to impact some more than it does others but you are here today to talk about a new technology to help people sort of navigate um, this uh, this growing issue talk about what is futuristic and, and what is it that people need to do a better job of um, and when it comes to this diabetes, because we also, Mae Cremens was diagnosed with type one diabetes at the age of five and celiac disease at age 15. And after struggling throughout her teenage years with her diabetes management, she now shares her journey also about living a healthy, balanced and joy-filled life. Online, Mae just finished the New York City Marathon. And let me tell you, that's a feat in and of itself. But Dr. Lai, tell us what is out there that people should be aware of. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. Um, I would say the, the thing to be aware of is um, type 1 diabetes is a very burdensome condition. It's often, uh, there's often no family history and people are diagnosed um, very suddenly and um, they present with weight loss and um, thirst and, a, and needing to go to the toilet very frequently. And these are very acute symptoms that generally appear out of nowhere. And um, if people have these symptoms of weight loss um, and feeling thirsty, they should definitely see their doctor and get checked out for type 1 diabetes. Well, tell um, us the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Yeah, so with 
type one, um, generally a younger population uh, who are previously completely healthy and out of the blue get diagnosed uh, with those symptoms. So it occurs because of a um, autoimmune destruction of the beta cells. So the same cells that kick in when you get the general flu or a virus, um, for some reason, we don't know exactly why, um, that immune reaction causes the destruction of the pancreatic beta cells. And um, so that is what we call type one diabetes. And in that condition, it's life threatening and you need insulin therapy immediately and you need it for the rest of your life to stay alive. So it's really important that people with type one diabetes, people like Meg have access to insulin therapy and have effective therapies that can be given so that insulin can be given safely and the exactly the right amount um, for people to live. Type 2 diabetes generally occurs in the older population, generally occurs over many years, um, and a large percentage of people um, have either genetic predisposition or have um, uh, or suffer from obesity, that these are risk factors for type 2 diabetes and also generally happens as you age as well. So as we all get older, we're all at risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And that tends to be a condition that happens steadily over time where there's progressive loss of beta cell function. And when you're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, it means that your pancreas just can't keep up um, with managing your glucose levels anymore. And so you need therapy for that. In the beginning, it's often oral medication and then later on as the disease progresses you may need insulin therapy. Meg, what is the hardest part for you in managing this disease and and when you look at where you started and you think about the devices and treatments that are more technologically advanced and relevant today, what are the differences for you? Yeah, so it is just a disease that takes so much time and effort. And really what the technology has allowed us to do is get back time in our life, right? It just simplifies things. There's still effort that we have to put in. We still have to prepare, but it's really made it um, be able to make life easier. So I can run the marathon and not have to worry as much about this blood sugar because I have this technology that's helping me. Uh, is diet make the best way to manage it and what role does technology play so diet can play a part insulin is the medicine that we need um but we do have to pay attention to diet count carbohydrates pay attention to what we're putting into our body because we have to uh, be able to dose the insulin appropriately for what we're eating you know years ago the idea of uh, artificial pancreas would have been, you would have been hallucinating. But that's the reality of the world today, Dr. Lai. That's right. Um, it's uh, still relatively new technology and not everyone with type 1 diabetes even knows about this technology and very few people with type 2 diabetes actually use um, technology uh, such as glucose sensors and pumps. And so it, it has revolutionized um, insulin delivery, especially for the type one population and young people, um, actually people of all ages like Meg uh, with type one. So the, um, the systems that we develop deliver insulin very precisely um, directly into the patient. Uh, and it does that by taking the glucose sensor signal from continuous glucose sensors, um, such as the Dexcom G6, so these devices are worn on body. They directly talk to each other with the Omnipod uh, insulin delivery system. And every five minutes, it's giving you exactly the right ins in insulin um, that you need um, to stay in range. Um, coming up later, Virtual Morel will be joining us to talk about his new book. Uh, we're going to come back with Meg and Dr. Lai with much more as we remember and pay focus to uh, National Diabetes Month. Remember these fast facts. 37 million Americans have diabetes, 5 to 10 percent diagnosed with type 1, and 90 to 95 percent diagnosed with type 2, the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. We'll be back.
Meg, when you think about the fact of what you've had to overcome and you were able to run that marathon, what kind of hope does that give others? And then also talk about how critical the relationship is between the physician and the patient. Yeah, I mean, I, running a marathon in itself is difficult, but doing it with diabetes, you have this other level of management that you have to do. You're not just training for a long run, you're also training for how you're gonna manage your blood sugars mm -hmm. on that day. So I would just say to people who have type one and just advocate with your doctor, what do you wanna do with your life and find that technology that helps support what those things are that you wanna do. Should the government play a greater role uh, with providers and patients, Dr. Lee? And if so, what is that role? Yeah, I think the um, access to technology is really critical and there's really fantastic technology out there, but in order for it to reach as many users as possible, um, governments need to pay for it. And I think um, around the nation, we are seeing um, excellent coverage of the products, but certainly there um, there's always opportunity to increase um, the accessibility to reduce out-of-pocket costs for, for users. Um, and so we're always looking at ways to do that at Insulet. You know, we're here in Washington, D.C., and one of the biggest issues for many Americans are the astronomical rise in and health costs. How do we tap down to bring the cost down, Dr. Lai? Yeah, I think the technology has to be beneficial for people. And um, and I, I see that very much in the technology of Omnipod 5. So be, before, without this technology, people had to manage their diabetes on their own and figure out exactly how much insulin to, to give and be at risk of both high blood sugar levels as well as low. And so technology and innovation like Omnipod 5 ring, brings life-changing benefits to people like Meg, enabling her to run marathons. I mean, it's just incredible what this technology can do. So it's this pre pre very precise insulin delivery that we're able to do with Omnipod 5. And it is, uh, in fact, the world's first and only tubeless automated insulin delivery system. And it's this type of the technology, it, it's incumbent upon companies like ours to improve the technology and bring innovation that is life-changing to users. And that is what um, uh, enables us to um, bring continue to bring benefits to our users. Take us through an average day for, for you who have suffered, Meg, to what is your life like today? Oh, um, well, I would say that, you know, back when I didn't have technology like this, the biggest thing that comes to mind is sleep. So, like, having to eat a low or high blood sugar in the middle of the night, it just sets your whole day up for failure because you're tired and then you also have to manage your blood sugars during the day. Technology like this helps you sleep through the night and it helps you just manage those blood sugars without as much effort so that you're able to focus more on your day. You're able to live the life that you want. You know, we have um, continuous glucose monitors and so many other advances. Dr. Lai, what is next that has you excited? Um, in diabetes, I, I think continuing to bring um, convenience and reducing the burden of diabetes for our users is um, always at the forefront of our minds. Like how do we make Meg's life easier so that she can run her next marathon and, and not worry so much? I think still today, diabetes um, is even with the best of technology, it, it still is incredibly burdensome. People have to watch what they eat um, and dose. still have, having to dose the right amount of insulin in order to really optimize their glucose levels and keep them in range. Um, you know, the issue with blood glucose is being out of range, especially running high, is the risk of, um, of kidney disease and, and nerve nerve damage um, and cardiovascular uh, outcomes um, and all of that. So it, it is a disease where if you, if you don't manage, 
manager or if you don't have all the tools to best manage it, then you're at risk of complications later on. And so that is something that I'm looking at is, um, and what we're focused on as a company is bringing our technology uh, Omnipod 5 to as many users around the world as quickly as possible. Well, I cannot thank um, you and Meg enough for joining us, Dr. Lee. Uh, Lie and uh, is quickly is America leading the way? Yeah, absolutely. We um, today we we are absolutely leading the way in automated insulin delivery for um, uh, people with diabetes. Thank you both, and thank you so much for what you do. And, and Meg, thank you so much for sharing your story and giving people for hope who also suffer with diabetes. I'm Armstrong sure Williams. When we return. Um, virtual Morel tells his journey about the hope for America. We'll be back. <laughs> virtual Morel, thank you for being in our broadcast house. The memoir of a Black Panther. Wow. Talk about in pursuit of America's promise in your journey, in your book? It's been a journey. It's been a journey to, uh, to hold America and the Constitution to its promise for all Americans. Is to America making progress in that promise? Yes. And where is the hard work that's needed now? The hard work today, I would suspect, is among the people themselves. Mm -hmm. And what is it that the people need to do themselves? To understand that the salvation of America and the, self, and the direction of America for its future rests upon its people. There needs to be a committed understanding that we're all going to get there together. How important, because you talk about this in the book, the, the morality, the principles, the discipline, tradition in, in that journey. It is extremely important, and I, from time to time, get lost in understanding and that what keeps me going is my moral clarity, a moral certainty that we will get there. When I think about how hard we had it in the 60s, the 50s, or 40s, it doesn't take long for me to quickly reflect on the journey of our ancestors from West Africa to America on a transatlantic voyage. We could not have had it any more difficult than they did. Where is there? Pardon? Where is there that we're trying to get to? We want to be considered by all to be Americans. Not second class and not third class. Americans. What is the best example in what discipline, uh, in what field, where you believe that America is at its best showing that everyone is equal and valued and brings something special to this tapestry? I don't think I've seen it. You haven't? No. but Have I've you se seen it anywhere else around the world? No. But I have seen progress in visualizing that concept. And, the, and what I've seen, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, but where we fall short is on the economic issues. We fall short. When you say economic, you mean creating wealth, having more opportunities, a better education, more entrepreneurs? Wealth generation, creating wealth, creating wealth from generation to generation. And the way to do that is by land and ownership of land, and we are losing that uh, um, that basic ownership. And why? Well, some of us sold land to move to other places where we thought it would be better. But isn't that a freedom, free will, and it's a choice It is we free make? will. It is free will, but it's also a miscalculation. So what is your advice to people who think about selling their land? Hold on to your land. Hold on to that wealth. Hold on to it and build on it. Build on that land whatever you have to build to make it more profitable, whether it's crops, but make it work for you. We have a situation, Armstrong, that we have to create our opportunities. 
And there are three basic ways to do it. Through the legal system, through education, and through voting. All else falls as subcategories to those three fundamental areas. If we're not educated, if we don't fight the legal fights through the courts, if we don't get an education, we're going to lose. One of the, I think, the most important parts of your book is the structure of the family. I'm sorry? It's the structure of the family, the men in the household, men raising their sons, sons having fathers. And talk about the, the need for men of character and discipline and sacrifice and leadership. You know, Marvin Gaye and used to write about things like the children. The children are the leaders of our future. And if we don't give them strong moral principles, if we don't raise them to understand what America is about and what it's for and who benefits from it, we lose. What do you think the greatest progress, and we're talking to Virtual Morel in his new book, In Pursuit of America's Promise, what do you think the greatest work needs to be done? Voting. Voting? Yes. I think we... To you, it doesn't matter whom they vote for. You just want them to vote. 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 Okay. Vote. Progress that we've made has been made through voting. The ballot. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You are from South Carolina. I am originally from Louisiana. The South... It's a salvation for America because that's where the votes are. That's where our people are, that's where African Americans are. And if we don't target, I don't care what party you belong to, but our salvation, where we can build on, is by voting. Virtual Morel is, I guess, the author of The Pursuit of America's Promise. We'll be back with some final thoughts. I'm Armstrong Williams. If you believe every child is deserving of a quality education, please go to educationjusticefoundation.com. You know, there's a, so much pain in this volume of work by you. How do people heal the wounds? The short answer is with victories. The long answer <clears throat> is through work, hard work, organization, recognizing that <clears throat> once again, Armstrong, our ability to free ourselves of the pain is by recognizing that nothing comes without a struggle. Mm -hmm. The pain. No, no, go ahead. The pain is consistent with not struggling just the pain being inflicted upon you. How do you respond to that pain? By reverse, how do you reverse it? Education, judicial system, and voting. So, so the important question to you is, do you think this reality, this pursuit of equality in America will ever happen? Are we close to that dream? I, I don't know if I can answer that question, but I can answer it the way that is addressed to me. But I can answer it this way. What else can we do? We have to struggle and strive for it. So long as we hear generational strength, generational development, and evolution will make it better. Well, I encourage people to go to Amazon and wherever to get, a, get your copy of your book. It's The Pursuit of America's um, Promise. Um, it's on sale, www.virtualmorel.com. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank for you this for edition having me, Armstrong. Show. It's been a thank you for writing your book, In Pursuit of America's Promise. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank Take you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.